Welcome to Circle of Town. Today we have Wasp, classic Chris Holmes era, that mean man on guitar. So let's get on to the gear that he used and then I'll show you what I used. It's actually similar, if you're new to this channel, it's similar to a video I did a while back on Motley Crue. <laughs> Another similar thing that happened in one of my other videos in my Master of Puppets video where I sped up the tape literally because that's what they did on Master of Puppets on the, on the title song. They actually played it slow and tuned down and sped up the tape to make it tighter. Cheating, but if you cheat and it sounds amazing, then cheat, 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 cheat away. And Wasp did that too. So often uh, Chris would tune down half a step and then in the mastering process, they would uh, speed up the tape. I think that comes to bit Blackie in the ass a little bit because when he's got older, he can't hit those notes, you know? That, and they were insane notes to begin with, you know, even a, a step or two down. So uh, he's been caught lip syncing a couple of times. So what did Chris use for Circus Era Wasp? He used two... 1971-1972 uh, super leads, so plexis, and luckily I have two. Apparently at least one of them was a Jose mod, but I don't have concrete evidence on that, but somebody who knows uh, the gear well told me that. He also suspected that there was uh, Celestian 65s in the cabinets, not the matching cabs from uh, 71. But it doesn't stop there. To get that signature sound, he often used like a almost a slapback reverb, uh, a delay, or a a chorus effect. It was the old Lexicon PCM41. He also used a PQ3 processor, which is a parametric equalizer. So uh, that's the main flux of it. And the guitar was his famous, which he bust up like five times and just put new necks on it all the time and glued the thing back together, Charvel Star. And he also had things like Randy Rhodes Customs because Grover Jackson actually really helped him out and trust and believed in him early on in his career, which is pretty cool. He's similar to me where he prefers lower, flatter frets because like me, I dig in so hard. If I had high frets, like chunky frets, it goes out of tune when you press in. Unlike him, uh, he has low action. Uh, I don't like low action. I like to, I like the move, the plenty of string movements. He used lighter gauge strings than me. He used, I think, 42s to nines. So what did I use? Since I don't have the that lexicon, I have something similar, an MXR, the, the earliest digital delays, and uh, I use that in a chorus mode. So here's mine without chorus. And here's mine with chorus. Thank you. 
I didn't get as much distortion for two reasons. I didn't play as loud as I usually do because my baby was right here and it kind of scares it when this is rumbling. But uh, also I used a different type of guitar. I just had to use this because I just I just got old uh, 60s T-tops uh, pickups in this. So I just have to try it out. So I didn't have as much gain. It was pretty close though. That, that album version, not the live version, which is about as live as the album version, but the album version uh, is pretty low gain. So it's pretty close. I honestly think if I just used uh, Duncan Distortion, which I think is what he used, that would have been enough gain on top to actually push me over that edge. But I loved my sound and I used, my Plexi has a, a master volume mod on it. And the other one has a Langner mod, which is similar to the Jose mod, just goes a bit more gonzo. So I have a similar setup. So I think between the two of them, I got really close on this one. And I think if I just used a different guitar and I had the, those specific, you know, uh, lexicon effects and the rest of it, I would have nailed it. And I used greenbacks. So maybe he did use greenbacks. So it's, uh, here's my, uh, my mic positions, an SM57 on those. So that'll, that'll get you in Chris Holmes mode. Certainly got me. It, it was fun because it was the, the type of tone where you could dig in. A lot of people think that that movie he was in and how ridiculous Ozzy looked in it and how kind of sad Chris Holmes looked, you know, when he was just literally drowning his sorrows, almost. People say that that was the end of the hair metal era. That movie had a lot to do with it. So, and I kind of half believe that because I, was, I wasn't into it back then either. I was a thrash guy. So, you know, Wasp, things like that wasn't my bag. But it's the type of thing like Duran Duran where you listen back and you think, Oh, that's pretty cool, actually. And I, I'm the same with Wasp because it was a, just a little bit too cheesy for me. And so, to be honest, at the time, so was Ozzy, so was uh, Kiss, so was a lot of those bands. I was more, I was all about Sepultura and the Bolt Thrower and all that type of stuff. But as time goes on, and then all my favorite genres peter out, you have to go back, right? Because compared to modern music, modern metal and rock, this stuff has balls, you know? There is a, a, a new documentary coming out on him which is going to be interesting. It's been released in January. I tried to get a review press copy of it, like they, like I got on the Killing Joke uh, video I did, but uh, they said that they, they're not giving out press until uh, January. So if I can get an early copy of that, I'll let you guys know if it's any good. I can't wait to see it. There's lots of stories. This one is quite timely because he was a very good friend of Eddie Van Halen back in the day. And uh, in fact, there's a cool story about one of Chris Holmes' guitars ending up on one of those early Van Halen albums. Who inspired me a lot was Eddie Van Halen. You know, not as just a guitar player, just as a human being. As just the way he was to other people. We grew up in Pasadena, that's the shadow of Van Halen. And actually I think Chris lent Eddie some of his cabinets and stuff for some of the earlier shows they did at the Pasadena Civic. Chris and Eddie were like this in the early days. I can remember numerous times going to the Pasadena Civic, and this is just before the Van Halens got their record contract. And you'd see the stage set up. Half the equipment that Eddie was using was Chris's. There's a club called the Starwood, and it was big in the late 70s. It lasted till about 78 or 9. I played there a few times. Van Halen played there all the time. And Ed would borrow some of my equipment to play. And I wasn't, I didn't, the guy that tuned his guitars, so I'd just go m help move equipment, you know, I was a roadie. They used to, you know, trade gear back and forth with the bigger shows because they didn't have the money to own all their own gear. I grew up in Pasadena, he grew up in Burbank, it's really close to each other. And there was always a rival between Van Halen and Quiet Riot. And if you're a Van Halen fan, you, you don't go to Quiet Riot gigs, you know, they've all played backyard parties. And... Uh, if I was caught going to a Quiet Riot gig, I'd have to kick my ass next time they saw me at a Van Halen gig. <laughs> it's just, there's a big rival between them, you know. Chris had this the right guitar that just had just the right sound that Eddie needed. I had crashed a motorcycle, ended up in the hospital. And um, I was laid up in the hospital. He came in and asked me if he could borrow my guitar for on his album. I said, yeah, I'll just go buy him 
told him, you know, tell my mom. I said you can borrow it. He went over and picked it up. This is uh, Chris Holmes's original 1975, late 75 Ibanez destroyer, one of the first ones off the boat from uh, Japan. These both came from the same store, the sound chamber, and he ended up cutting it up and ruining the sound. He had cut cut a big chunk out of his, made a star out of it, and it changed the sound. And he just wanted to borrow my guitar. So I had his guitar, the one that was on the album cover. I think they tried uh, a couple of different guitars on that thing, but I don't think he was able to achieve the sound that he wanted through the mix. He called Chris and he said, hey, can I borrow that Ibanez Destroyer? Because it's a really good sounding guitar, and it still is, as beat up as it is. And uh, Chris said, okay, but you got to give me a guitar to replace it. So Chris got to take a loan of that guitar. So Edward used this guitar on Women and Children First. They had just that right raunch to get it. Just that right raunchy crunch, and there it is. We all hear it. It's on the album. We know it. And thanks to my patrons of Tom. Please join my Patreon. Started. L, you're the man. Thank you very much, Rich P and Co. Keeping these speakers flapping and uh, helping me with this curse. And a big thanks to Robin Hansen who helped me out with a lot of this information. He uh, contacted me through the fa our Facebook group. There's lots of uh, very knowledgeable guys on the Facebook group in amongst the memes. He actually knows a lot of the settings, including the, he got me the parametric EQ settings, which he copied for me from an old blurry photo. So yeah, search Circle of Tone on Facebook. Come join, come share your music, share your channel, whatever you do. So uh, I'm going to play you out with some more riffing. Have a good one, guys. And uh, if you can become a patron, that would be awesome because I can cut my damn strings. Mm -hmm.